And um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Burry. Um, he's a lecturer in computational sociology at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, before starting his position in Edinburgh, he was at Oxford from the very start of his academic career. Uh, Chris specializes in the fields of political sociology and communication. He's also a computational methodologist, innovating on uh, techniques in natural language processing and the repurposing of digital trace data for social science research. He's particularly interested in advancing the use of um, uh, social media, news, and communication data to study populations that have traditionally been hard to reach in empirical social sciences, and also interested in the use of new computational techniques for the study of changing political belief systems. Uh, notably, Chris is the author and creator of uh, the academic Twitter uh, R package that allows, uh, allowed us and thousands of researchers <laughs> around the world to uh, integrate with the uh, Twitter academic API. Not for until, long. At least yeah. until next week. <laughs> I stole your punchline, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and we thank you uh, for that. Uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for uh, being here, Chris. Thank you. No, it's really wonderful to be invited. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think of this. Um, uh, so I'll get going. Uh, this is a paper that I uh, have been working on for a while now with uh, Neil Ketchley at the University of Oxford, who's in politics, as is Alexander Siegel, uh, as well as uh, somebody called Mas'ab Baghdori, who you'll see uh, on your screen is at Walmart. He's a data scientist at Walmart, but was formerly a computer scientist uh, working in principally Arabic language, natural language processing. Um, and I'll get to, I'll get to why um, uh, we're working with him um, uh, when we get to the section um, about the data itself. Get his appropriate credits uh, when we get there. Anyway, let's get going. Um, <clears throat> so what question are we asking here? Uh, essentially what we're saying, um, or what we're interested in, is what happens to the way in which news is communicated, articulated to populations uh, before and after so-called media capture, that is when authoritarian governments either put in place uh, their own uh, uh, you know, loyal servants within positions of influence uh, in the main uh, state or private news outlets within a given country, or conversely, what happens right when there's some kind of uh, transition, when there's some kind of uh, democratic uh, opening, uh, and how can we capture this? Uh, so in plain English, what we're really targeting uh, in this paper is whether when events like this happen, uh, and that should be media capture and or opening, are newspapers uh, less critical or more critical of the political executive? And I'll get on to why we're focusing on the executive in just a moment. <clears throat> so why is this important? Well, hopefully, you know, as communication scholars and computational social scientists and people interested in this kind of thing in the room, you'll be convinced that it's important. But we know uh, that media capture, uh, that is you know, uh, overweening uh, influence in large media institutions is a key arm of coercion within authoritarian contexts. Right? The way in which authoritarians choose to manage and discipline uh, their citizenry. We also know that these kinds of events, media capture or, or authoritarian control of media outlets, uh, have important consequences both for political attitudes and for trust in or loyalty to or favorability toward authoritarian uh, incumbents. It also has consequences right, for the possibility of uh, opposition of collective action of some form. And we know from literature uh, by people like Jennifer Pan and others uh, on China that the kind of information that is often censored or taken down or not allowed within these contexts uh, has to do with collective action threat. Right? Uh, and the way in which authoritarians choose to discipline that is by not allowing certain types uh, of content. So I'm getting a lot, a bit of feedback on your end. Maybe, maybe it would make sense to mute it, Almog. Uh, yeah, I can mute it. Okay, us. sorry. Please feel free to jump in at any point if you have any questions there. Um, so, the third reason 
uh, that it's important, and, and this is the kind of main focus, or I suppose it's the main thrust of what we're doing here, is that measuring media criticism, measuring criticism of uh, political executives and key figures within governments is an important index of so-called media freedom, right? This is what people tend to measure when they're trying to get some kind of sense of the freedom uh, of media institutions to report on certain subjects and certain individuals within authoritarian contexts or democratic contexts. <clears throat> Oops. So what do we know already? So I think the first thing to point out here is that when we think about media capture or authoritarian influence in media institutions, we might have this idea of kind of a big brother surveilled state where media capture is total, right? You're not allowed to say anything that is in any way critical or implying criticism of uh, authoritarian uh, incumbents, of dictators, and so on and so forth. And while that may have been true for regimes uh, of old, many decades back in the, mid, uh, the middle uh, part of the 20th century, it's not really the case anymore. In fact, there's important recent theoretical work that talks about so-called informational autocrats. And these are not people who deny the media the opportunity to say anything or do anything that might in any way imply criticism of the state. Instead, what we see is that there are certain topics, certain subjects that media are allowed to report on relatively freely and there's theoretical reasons for why that might be as well because if we think about how a state functions right it needs some kind of information in order to function we need to know in order to allocate resources appropriately and so on uh, whether there are problems at the local level uh, and one way in which governments uh, authoritarian gov governments who often lack uh, capacity in order to monitor properly and collect data freely on these subjects, they rely on the fourth estate to some extent to report on these subjects. We know that's the case, for example, uh, in Russia, we know it's the case uh, in China, and there's good theoretical reason, in other words, to think that that would make sense. However, what we also know is that there tend to be so-called red lines, right? There are some things that within an authoritarian context where media are not free, there are things you cannot say and there are subjects you cannot broach and there are individuals that is very difficult to criticize. And that red line often takes the form of the political executive, by which I mean key ministers of state and the president and the high judiciary, right? <clears throat> So how are we studying this uh, at the moment? How are we getting a sense of overtime trends within nations or across nations of how free media are? Well, we have very important work looking qualitatively at the mechanisms by which authoritarians uh, gain influence within uh, media institutions, the way in which they uh, selectively allocate personnel into these institutions in order to exert influence and make sure that so-called red lines uh, are not crossed. Obviously, what that doesn't tell us is anything about overtime trends or aggregate trends uh, in the main. And in order to do that, that second thing, to look at trends and to look at uh, measurements or to derive measurements of media freedom, often what we're doing is we're relying or pretty much solely relying on so-called expert surveys. I've filled these in myself. I'm sure people in the room have done similar things. Now, there are famous institutions that do this. One of them is VDEM, another is Freedom House. There are several others, uh, some of which are still reporting these indices, some of which are not. And these uh, surveys are sent out to experts within a particular domain, a particular field, or a particular country. And they say things like, in 1950, uh, was the media free in Egypt, yes or no? In 1952, was the media free in Egypt, yes or no? And there's kind of an index, like one, two, three, yes, it was completely free, it was kind of middling, or no, it wasn't free at all. And then these uh, survey institutions, they aggregate up these responses, they use some kind of uh, ideal point estimation in order to derive uh, an index. And as a result of that, we get things like this, right? This is a measure of the extent to which print media in Egypt 
uh, could be critical or was allowed to be critical uh, of, uh, uh, of the state of the executive. We see after a, a coup uh, by Nasser in 1956, we have a, a downturn followed by a sort of an incremental period of liberalization. And then we, if we see here over on the right hand side uh, of this graph, <clears throat> we see a big uptick around 2011 in the Arab Spring, followed by a big downturn, right? followed by which is uh, key to the uh, democratic. Uh, reversal after the coup of 2013 and the ascension to power uh, of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in the country. <clears throat> now other indices uh, do the same thing or do a similar thing and give you a kind of aggregate global freedom, uh, global press freedom or country level press freedom index. Now one thing to say is that Freedom House have actually stopped doing this. They stopped in 2017 in favor of a kind of digital freedom index which sort of incorporates the printed press but sort of doesn't and it, I've, I've looked at kind of combining these to see if we can derive some measure uh, of the countries that we're focusing on in this paper but it doesn't seem possible. But anyway, if we go back to this example, this is the kind of thing we're thinking about when we're measuring uh, the ability of print media to be criticism, to function freely as a fourth estate. And they ask questions like this. These aren't the only questions. This is one example from Freedom House, okay, uh, where it's asking, um, and there will be a point score applied as a result, whether, for example, there are penalties applied for libeling officials of the state, i.e., you know, uh, individuals within the executive. and. Uh, the idea behind this is to measure the extent to which the media can be critical in some sense. Okay, so what are we focusing on today against all of that backdrop? Well, two countries, uh, and not uh, as long an observation period as we just saw in that slide, with the VDEM data, but a shorter period of time that's nonetheless uh, very relevant. Egypt 2008 to 2020 and Tunisia 2008 to 2022. Uh, I'll explain why the time periods are different in just a second. So during this time, what do we see? Well, in Tunisia in 2010, uh, in December of 2010, uh, the country witnessed a uh, national uprising against the uh, over two decade rule of uh, Ben Ali, uh, which led to his overthrow uh, in mid January. Following on from that, we see the January 25th revolution uh, and in February of that year, the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak uh, in Egypt. These were momentous events, of course, that I'm sure uh, you all uh, remember in this room. Uh, maybe there are some young ones among you, but I'm sure you all remember uh, in this uh, room. And they had uh, a tangible, substantive impact on the way in which the media operated. So after the overthrow of Mubarak in 2011, in February 2011 in Egypt, we see this kind of period of liberalization. We see political parties emerge. We see uh, free elections. They were free elections, uh, though we still see we still see, excuse me, uh, a, a military um, or a high degree of influence um, from the Egyptian military, let's say, it was nonetheless a period in which we saw uh, a real flourishing of independent media and new newspapers that were reporting, as you can see in this image on the right, freely on protest, on opposition to governments, on uh, political events of different uh, colours uh, and types. After this period, of, however, and the 2013 coup uh, led by the Egyptian military that resulted ultimately in the accession to power of Abdel Fattah Sisi, we see this period of kind of media recapture, deliberalization, if you like. And we see articles emerging like this one, which are kind of singing the praises of uh, the great leader, the new president, Sisi, what he's done to turn the country uh, around and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Oops, that's not showing. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll go from this one. Um, so in Tunisia, around the same time, as I just said, we see 
uh, revolution in 2010 to 11, the overthrow of Ben Ali, we see also a period of liberalization, democratization, a series of successful free and fair elections, the flourishing uh, of independent media, new political parties. I say this it, like uh, it was kind of a, a golden age of freedom and happiness. Obviously, there were still many problems in the country, but what we see and what is important here is that we do see a period of sustained liberalization and democratization. Now, in 2022 and uh, the um, the accession to the presidency of Kais Saeed, uh, uh, sorry, from 2020 and the accession to the presidency of Kais Saeed, we do see uh, sustained and concerning threats to the independence of the media, but nothing like the recapture of uh, the fourth estate that took place uh, in Egypt. Uh, now, this is also the reason that we've got an extended observation period up to 2022 for Tunisia. Uh, Mossad kindly uh, gave us uh, these data when after Saeed came to power and we were a bit worried about what would happen afterwards and wanted to measure uh, media criticism. And so that's the reason for the extended observation period uh, in Tunisia. OK, and this is what uh, the VDEM scores for both countries look like. So what do we see here? Well, we see um, a kind of uh, period <clears throat> of uh, after the uh, Arab Spring of 2011, we see this kind of uptick um, in, uh, and this is the measure of the ability of print broadcast media to be critical, print or broadcast media to be critical, remember? And we see uh, that this is increasing. Uh, a score of three essentially means you can report on anything and the media is entirely free. And then after 2013, we see this big downturn right, in the VDEM score, where zero is kind of like total media capture and the ability to report on next to nothing, a kind of 1984 scenario, if you like. Uh, Tunisia, we see something similar. After the Arab Spring, uh, even uh, more sustained uh, period of media liberalization and freedom uh, to uh, to criticize um, and to uh, uh, function freely. Uh, a slight decrease um, around the time of a uh, crisis in 2014, but nonetheless, that then remains a sustained high level until the end of our observation period in 2022. Okay. Oh, sorry, this goes to 2021 because the VDEM scores for 2022 are not out yet, but apparently out this month. So, you know. I'm sure you're all on the edge of your seats. Anyway, data and method. This is probably what you're all coming for, uh, being people who are interested in this kind of thing. What are the data? Well, the data are really cool. Um, oh, that observation period is wrong. I should change that. Um, forget that. Uh, but I'm using Egyptian news and Tunisian uh, uh, Egyptian news and Tunisian uh, news uh, media from over 100 different newspapers, about, I think, 79 in Egypt and about 20 five or 30 uh, in Tunisia. Where did these come from? Well, Mos Abadouri, uh, the co-author on this paper, now at Walmart, as I mentioned, during his master's uh, in computer science, started setting up these news aggregation platforms, which are based on hundreds of bespoke crawlers that daily crawl uh, major news outlets, major and actually quite small <laughs> news outlets in Egypt, Tunisia, as well as five other countries uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, Yemen, uh, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, where else? Sudan, I think. Um, maybe one other, Morocco, Magdalene, that was the first one he did because he's indeed Moroccan himself. Uh, this is an amazing effort, as I'm sure you can all uh, recognize. Um, uh, and just for Egypt and Tunisia combined, we have around 35 million news articles over the period uh, of um, our observations. So 20, uh, 2008 to 2022 in total. <clears throat> and this is what we do. OK, these are a set of uh, politically relevant terms that we have uh, keyed to key themes within VDEM that um, set of expert surveys that I mentioned earlier today that looks at you know, different components of democratic institutions. And what we're focusing on uh, in uh, this paper is this component. Uh, we have all of these because we're thinking about doing many different things with these data, but this is the first thing we're doing. So these are a set of terms that we chose that uh, you know, reliably identify 
uh, topics or reporting related to the political executive in Egypt. So we have Ra'is uh, as the first one, which is President Tamfidhi, it's like judici uh, the judiciary, uh, Majlis al-A'la, which is like the high council for the uh, armed forces, um, minister and ministers, right? yeah, both plural and singular form. Plurals are difficult in Arabic, so you have to include both. Um, for Tunisia, we don't have these institutions, and actually uh, a, lot, a number of the institutions change name, meaning we can't necessarily kind of identify them consistently over the course of the uh, observation period. So instead, we use a kind of smaller dictionary just of ministers and, and president, but really these are the ones that are capturing most of the information uh, anyway. Okay. Now, the method, the main method we're using is this really cool new technique called a la carte embedding. So what's this? Well, a la carte embeddings um, are essentially a way of overcoming some of the computational costs of doing overtime embedding analyses um, that we had to uh, suffer before. So what do we have to do before? Let's say I was interested in, um, let's say I was interested in uh, the salient, no, let's say I was interested in like ethnic discrimination uh, over a four decade period um, and I wanted to use the Google Books corpus to look at like bias in like cultural output and so on. So I would basically train an embedding layer for every single time unit that I was interested in and normally that's decades so we would have an individual embedding for 1970 to 1980 then 1980 to 1990 etc etc and then I would look at things like uh, cosine similarity between words identifying uh, some ethnic group and then stereotype words uh, and look at how the similarity changed over time in order to derive some kind of representation of uh, the changes in ethnic discrimination over time. Now, that is extremely computationally expensive, especially if I want more granular time periods like weeks or days, because I would have to train an embedding layer over every single time unit. Now, what this approach does, and I'm going to explain uh, with a a diagram in just a moment. It essentially overcomes uh, the computational cost of that. It also overcomes some of the uh, so-called non-alignment problems whereby we're using separate embeddings to measure similarity and these things aren't necessarily therefore comparable between time units. Now there were and are ways of overcoming that as well but this technique does it without even having to worry about all of that. So it does two things. It overcomes computational costs. It's also more uh, robust. <clears throat> And what I do is something very simple. What we do is something very simple. Um, I create um, uh, an opposition, a kind of index of opposition, if you like. And in order to do that, I take an embedding layer that I've trained with uh, Egyptian or Tunisian news media data. I then subtract the word support or the vector for the word support from the vector for the word opposition. So why have I done this so simply? Well, the idea for all of this is that it's kind of scalable, right? It's scalable so that people like VDEM or others might in the future use techniques like this in place of or in addition to uh, using expert surveys. Why? Well, because if we have access to the data and these kinds of data are increasingly available, uh, we can actually use the raw text. We don't need to worry about individual um, uh, survey respondent bias, but also let's remember that if we have access to these data, this technique is like entirely free, right? I didn't have to spend any money uh, in order to do this. And it's actually pretty quick as well. So I wanna keep it as simple as possible so that we can think about how scalable this technique uh, could be. And what we do is we, so we take words, the words that I showed you just before, these ones uh, that identify the executive and we project them uh, onto this vector of opposition and support in order to look how close the words relating to the executive are to words about opposition uh, and support. And I'll show you in just a second how we do that exactly. <clears throat> and what we're saying is that this provides us with some kind of proxy measure of change in the use of critical language around the figure of the president and the political uh, executive. So how does this work? Right. This is the entire process that I used in order to process the data. So let's go through it from top to bottom. I'll go quickly because I know we don't have a huge amount of time. So I take a 10% sample. We don't need all of the data, at least for Egypt, for Tunisia, we use all of it because it's a smaller data set. Pre-process it very simply. Then we train this embedding layer. You'll know what a word embedding layer is. We use the glove algorithm. 
Um, and we have, therefore, this reference embedding layer for Egyptian news data. Then separately, we get a sample of a 10 percent sample of newspapers, those that we can kind of credibly say, yeah, these are like reputable outlets. They're not just like anything. We filter by political category because obviously news uh, is news will report on football, on gossip, on everything. Now, these are pre classified by uh, Musab's uh, uh, scraper as political or international or whatever. We use the political category. Why? Because we're interested in political re reporting on domestic topics. We also then use named entity recognition to detect named bylines. Why? Well, we think that people, uh, when they include their name on a piece, will be more likely right, to um, to express some kind of opinion uh, or position in regard uh, in relation to an event. I, it's not just kind of political, it's not just sort of like news chronicling or whatever. <clears throat> we pre-process again and we get our resulting kind of analysis text, if you like. <clears throat> Sorry, my screen is hidden. What do we do next? Okay, we then uh, divide the corpus into year week slices. Right? And then we generate our index of opposition that I mentioned before. Um, and then, and this is when I'm going to go on to the next slide to show you what's actually happening. I know it looks complicated. I promise it's not that complicated. Right. So for every single article, for every single week in every single year, what we do is we take the six words. And this is how the ALC embedding approach works. And it overcomes a lot of the costs of the previous approaches. We take six words around the word for the president. So the word president is here. I think you can see my cursor. These are the six words uh, around it. Um, well, some of the boxes aren't appearing anyway. Um, uh, and then we take the uh, the vector for that word from our reference embedding layer that we've already trained. So we only have to do it once. We then take the average of the words around the word president, for example, but it could also be minister, ministers, whatever. We take the average of all of those and we use that as our kind of representation for this year, uh, this week of this year of the political executive. Because what this ALC embedding approach has found essentially is that uh, uh, the words around a particular target word can provide us when averaged over a sufficient amount of data can provide us with a good point estimate for where that word is falling within semantic space, within the vector of semantic space, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. And we, yeah. Do you take questions at the end or can we ask? Absolutely, no, please, please interrupt, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering about the, the context window of six. Is, is that yeah. like built on, on some simulations or something or is there like a rule of thumb or? It's, it's, it's a good question. It's more rule of thumb that um, actually, no, it's not rule of thumb because uh, people have tested this. So Arthur Sperling has uh, done some tests uh, varying the context window from like 6 to 12 using this technique or 6 to 12 and 24, I think, and um, recommends the use of 6 because it's computationally cheaper and it, rely it provides a kind of reliable representation of, of that word. Um, remember also that for uh, every week of every year, we've got huge numbers of news articles, yeah. right? This isn't just like a few news articles. We're using thousands and thousands for every uh, week of every year um, that contain the word president. So we've then induced like a year week specific embedding, right, for our for our president words or our executive words. And then we just project those onto our index, our index of opposition. How do we do that? We just measure the cosine similarity. And this is what results. We have our year week specific uh, projection onto an opposition index. And that's what we can then go on to display. That's what, that, that's what we then go on to, uh, to uh, graph. And this is what we see. So happily, uh, they look kind of alike. Right. Uh, so these are our embedding only based estimates um, of uh, media criticism. We see that uh, they kind of go up over time and then around the time of the coup, they swiftly go down uh, and continue going down. And it looks kind of like, I think, uh, the VDEM uh, measure, which was uh, labeled by uh, and coded by humans. Tunisia, uh, similarly, we see this uptick around the time of the revolution, a bit of a downturn similarly around this time, uh, which is steeper than uh, in VDEM, but it kind of then sort of, uh, it, it then kind of varies uh, relatively mildly over time and kind of stays at an overall uh, regular uh, uh, 
level of um, cosine similarity of the opposition. Um, we've done some robustness tests. My authors are in the process of doing uh, uh, additional uh, analyses. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we've done a validation tests using human coders. We've also used these to then uh, fine tune a transformer model uh, using both Arabic language text and the and translated uh, English language uh, text as well, and that one's in process. Um, my co-authors are currently looking at doing additional cut point analyses and uh, different diff approaches. Um, I can show you the results of those uh, if you're interested. Um, but essentially, this is uh, the, the trend we get for Egypt. These, uh, when we ask uh, Egyptians to label the data, we see a pretty similar trend, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, and these are the transformer-based estimates. Now, this isn't working particularly well yet. Uh, why? Because uh, I think we don't have enough data for earlier periods, basically. Uh, but we see a like not dissimilar like downturn uh, uh, in uh, media criticism, and this is based, as I say, say on the uh, human-labeled uh, data. Um, but I realise that I'm coming to time, so I'm going to shut up and allow you to ask me questions and suggest. Uh, improvements and so on and so forth. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. Um, right, so we open it now for uh, for discussion. And um, and yeah, please raise your hand or just jump in or yeah. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Chris. That was very impressive and very interesting, especially what you said early on about the capture being sort of, you know, very different from 1984. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the extreme case, it can go there, but really it's it's much um, more graded. Now, looking at the both your data sets, where, like, I don't know if you can answer this question, but where would you put 1984, or put another way, how close is Egypt to 1984? Can you speculate? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think this is, look, this is kind of the last task we need to um, really engage, being that, like, okay, we can see these overtime trends, we can see they kind of reflect what we know about the, the situation, um, but what does like a one standard deviation decrease in a uh, cosine similarity to this opposition index actually like mean substantively? Uh, it's difficult to say. Right? We know that one standard deviation in, uh, decreases or increases are like substantively big if we sort of like take the overall, um, um, uh, if we take into account sort of overall distributions of the data. But I think, we do need, need still to answer that question of like you know, how total is um, this inability to report? And perhaps one way of doing that is to, well, one way of doing that is to rely on human labelers. And so we've done that and we do see this like drastic decrease in um, the ability of media to, to report on questions related to the executive. Another way of doing that is to look uh, more um, precisely at semantic change. So what are the differences we can observe in like the actual type of language that people are allowed to use? And we can also use like embedding based um, approaches uh, in order to like measure the before and after. So we can target particular words that denote criticism and see like the pro see the probability of using that word after a certain period of time versus before a period of time. And that gives you, I suppose, more of a handle on you know, how total this is, right? If the probability is so tiny relative to what it was before, then we do have some kind of relative measure of, of how total this capture is. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. It's kind of the last box, I hope, that we have to tick before we can send this to somebody to, to, to reject. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, I have a question. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for your Hi. talk. I'm, I'm Fabio. 
Uh, I, I was very curious, I mean, what you showed us uh, with the ACL, right, is really interesting. I'm eager to try it out. Uh, I did something similar many years ago, but with collocates. So I mm -hmm. tried to understand like mm. windows of words around the keyword. But collocates really work uh, around the concept of frequency. Mm -hmm. Now, this is really interesting, but the problem I had with collocates was that there wasn't really a good way to make the well, collocates process understand where a sentence started. So the problem is that if mm -hmm. the keyword is at the beginning of a sentence, it's going to grab the end of the sentence mm -hmm. uh, before mm -hmm. that, that is, isn't like really related to what, mm -hmm. what follows. Does mm -hmm. this like six window, six words window sort of consider that as well? Um, it doesn't, and the reason it doesn't is because there have been um, some simulations checking uh, mm -hmm. the quality of the output whether you, when you do or don't, and they're pretty similar. Oh, okay. um, so I, I, I just skip that step, basically. That's all right. and, and, um, but it's a very good question. Uh, the other thing to, to kind of emphasize is that the technique that you mentioned would be necessary if the data was smaller. Um, but because it's so big, we we kind of yeah <laughs> shrug our shoulders and say it's it, it's fine, um, which is maybe lazy, but it's also like as I said earlier in the presentation, it's it's more out of consideration of like wanting this to be scalable, mm -hmm. um, and if we want it to be scalable, we want to cut down as much as possible on any kind of additional input or computational costs that are involved. Like I maybe should. Um, put a score on like how much quicker this is than what it would have taken three years ago uh four years ago and maybe that would be helpful but put it this way to once we've done all the pre-processing steps which take uh with like a powerful computer like less than six hours um to then actually do the analysis of like projecting uh year week embeddings onto the um onto the opposition index it's it's like a matter of seconds so this is like it's extremely quick um and can be updated every single day if we wanted to yeah thank you yeah um thanks very cool stuff i so i i was wondering like where how do you take this forward i mean because mm. i i think that this is a very uh very nice example, and in a way, you're kind of validating the, the VDAM score and mm. um, and those measures. And and but this is something that we have like a, a some sort of a, um, an expert rating, right? Like domain knowledge that can help us put like a number on like mm -hmm. how the numbers is going. And and I wonder how how this can be used to uh, maybe have some sort of other indices that we don't have uh, those uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, those kind of metrics. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? That's a very good question. Um, so uh, earlier in the presentation, I halfway through, I showed that set of words that were key to key VDEM themes. Uh, target themes um, and you're right that we target something that people are measuring already on uh, in a piece of separate work uh, we're interested also in the, the way in which uh, key um, key concepts and questions key institutions in uh, emerging or consolidating democratic polities are discussed online or sorry in in news media right so one of them is democracy and words that have to do uh, with democracy and perhaps it would be interesting as an extension of this if we were to say okay it's not just the ability of the news media to be critical it's also the ability of the news media to kind of deliberate and communicate uh, key questions and concepts around like the idea of democracy, uh, the idea of an independent judiciary and so on. Um, and that would involve um, some more sophisticated approaches to actually processing uh, the text and um, deriving semantic meaning. But I think that's a, a really cool thing to try to do, even if we haven't achieved it yet, because it's it's also, as you as you imply by your question, it's 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 also not really something that you can ask a, an expert coder, 
this kind of sort of conceptual broader abstract question right like how free are the media to kind of deliberately openly and express themselves <laughs> you know about key uh, key questions within uh, de de like emerging policy emerging uh, democracies um so that's something i would like to dig into more and maybe in that way you'd be able to derive some new indices of you know things that matter in the way in which uh politics is communicated in the news media uh, that go beyond what we we tend to measure at the moment. If there are any ideas in the room, I, uh, I'm open to take it. Yeah, um, I, just to follow up on that, I don't know if this is an idea, it's actually a question, but uh, seems, if I understood you right, what you looked at is how much criticism of the government via support for the opposition was possible. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me, and, and that's really you know, very important, but it seems to me that there's another dimension here, and I don't know if you've captured that, and that is the extent to which the government is uncritically accepted and praised in the media. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, isn't that part of 1984 that the media are all, or, or North Korea, you know, mm -hmm. ooh, Kim Il sung you know, he doesn't yeah. even poop, or whatever they yeah. say, right? <laughs> um, that type of... Uh, do you capture that, or is this another dimension that's worth capturing? So I, I think we would capture that because the 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 vector onto which we're projecting our like period specific embeddings is just a vector of the word support minus the word opposition, um, or the other way around, um, and so like to be the like uh, one pole of that would be that you're only ever discussed in supportive terms. Um, but I suppose that is also kind of semantically distinct from like lavishing praise on a on a on an executive, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, maybe that could be something. I mean, that's a, a final thing to look at. I'm going to kind of iterate through different. Yeah, so, so um, if, I mean, if you had a cult, if you had a personality yeah. cult in a country, yeah. would your analysis pick that up? Yeah. Yeah, not precisely. Yeah. But maybe with a different vector. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah Christoph. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, th thank you so much for your interesting talk. I was wondering a, a bit in the same direction, um, and I'm not entirely sure whether I, whether you got it already or not. I mean, support does not necessarily mean that you're actually being supported sometimes, especially if you think of the US, of like mm -hmm. those uh, media conglomerates where just like if you're a, a right-leaning most of the time uh, person, yeah. you just bury certain stories that... Um, you don't want to see in the media about your preferred candidate and no. i am not entirely aware of the tunisian case but i think at least in egypt that happened a couple of times mm -hmm. and i had looked at the case like years ago so i'm not entirely sure but is that something that could be included in the model in a sense or is it just i don't know too, too difficult to detect yeah it's a good question it's a very good question I think that would probably be more amenable to some kind of dynamic topic model type thing. Um, it's not something you can do like very straightforwardly just using um, like vector projections, I don't think, because I mean, you're essentially looking for something that's not there, right? So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Steve, Steve did something that relates to it in the past. I can't remember the, exactly the, the correct paper, but if I remember correctly, um, you said that uh, every time Trump, uh, pardon oh, my yeah, language, yeah. fucked up, <laughs> yeah. um, something deviating, yeah. of course. So you could maybe model it using uh, like yeah. increased kind of patterns yeah. of something that tries to draw attention away from uh, yes. something and uh, then see, try right, to yeah, just like yeah. identify whether something else happened. Um, yeah, I can, I can send you that paper, Chris, but yeah, uh, please do. Christoph is right. I mean, we showed that Trump is uh, deflecting attention from things he didn't like mm -hmm. by tweeting about something else and then the media dropped the issue he didn't like. Um, mm. So that is, but of course you need to have 
you know, a strong individual, as in the case of Trump, who had direct access to his followers and his, you know, yeah. through his tweets to make that happen, yeah. uh, or to, to permit that analysis. But another thing I'm thinking of in this context, you're absolutely right, it's, it's hard to measure things that aren't there. Um, but it is a little easier to do that uh, by comparison to international media coverage. Mm. So, for example, in, in the United Kingdom, there is a topic that isn't there. It's mm -hmm. called Brexit uh, mm -hmm. for the last six years because mm -hmm. there's almost complete silence on that issue because it's, you know, too important to be talked about. Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting is that if, if you, I think you would pick that up compared to overseas coverage. Like the American media talk about Brexit more than the British media. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or at least they talk about it in more realistic terms, mm -hmm. and ditto for European media. Yeah. And and I wonder if you know that gives you some sort of a handle that that if the American media talk about Egypt and every time they talk about Egypt they talk about whatever this money laundering scandal, but that never shows up in the e Egyptian media, then maybe that gives you some sort of a handle on what's missing. Yeah. I think that's a nice idea. Um, it's also it relates to something that uh, I think one of my co-authors is is looking into at the moment because we also have access to some of the news media from like Morocco and Algeria and so on. So you can imagine a kind of diff and diff approach where you take that news media in Morocco or Algeria where media capture hasn't taken pl well, you know, there's media control but not necessarily about topics related to Egypt. And then you look at kind of exactly at those differences because and and I think that's important for two reasons. Firstly, because it gets at exactly what we were talking about, right? that we, we might be able to capture things that aren't there in the data for Egypt, but it also captures something else, which is a kind of uncomfortable criticism that we've got, but is, is nonetheless an entirely reasonable one, which is what if this is just showing the the Egyptian state is performing better, right? The reason the news media is <laughs> is less critical after the coup is because is because the authoritarian government are like are actually doing well. Now, I I don't I don't think that is the case, uh, but uh, you know there is surely there is surely some of that effect that is because some things are going better, right? Um, uh, probably a very small amount. <laughs> Uh, but, that's, um, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. maybe Brexit is terrific. That's why no one talks about yeah. it. Maybe. I, maybe. I haven't thought of that possibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think there's a really good point. Um, it's something we're we're pursuing at the moment, and I have a meeting with my co-authors in a week, and I'm I'm hoping they've done something on it. I'll report back. So, but isn't uh, that comparatively easy to control for? I mean, there are certain indices that expect, like check for government performance or mm -hmm. ease of doing business, stuff like that. The, yeah, look, there are, but then often we have to rely on administrative data that is produced by dictators and <laughs> the extent to which you know, we can... Like, I know what you yes. mean. Like, yeah, but I mean, we can use like internationally accredited sources Right, the, the the measure GDP and so on. I I completely agree. Um, I think that is something we're we're probably gonna have to put in in appendix to kind of answer that critique. Like, you know, what if this is just showing they're doing better? Um, and yeah. authoritarian regimes are surprised and sometimes surprisingly transparent mm -hmm. with their uh, performance. Russia, for example, has very good data at the um, local level. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. Uh, PhD supervisor just uh, had a just uh, like publishes a paper on that. And mm. it's surprising how transparent some of these regimes are because okay. they don't just don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we can can well incorporate some of that either descriptively or you know, I don't think we would introduce it into the main analysis, but I think descriptively it's important context yeah, to have, you're right, yeah. Um, so um, thinking of uh, uh, democratic backsliding, mm -hmm. um, so, um, like what comes to mind is as uh, the current state in Israel and and how the the, the judiciary uh, reform is now taking place and, and and envisioning such an analysis on the current um, media in Israel, I, I would think that the index will reach its peak right now and how um, in, in according to the like how uh, how free 
the media is, which is not true because there has been a, a democratic backsliding for, uh, mm. for quite some time, but there's mm. a lot of, of discussion at the, uh, just at the peak right now, which is about the, uh, the judicial reform. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, I mean, this is something that obviously can be, when looking at trends, this would be picked up, right? That afterwards, it's going to be uh, a, lot, uh, a lot less democratic, but, mm -hmm. uh, when there is such a reform or something that um, just a, a very consequential event, uh, the index might work in in, in the reverse direction. Mm. I mean, see what you mean. So yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so I think the important thing to to keep in mind though is that you know democracy indices are composite indices of of. Ten, tens of different, if not more, uh, uh, of different individual indices that go toward measuring the overall democratic health of somewhere. I completely see your point that, you know, in the in the the period immediately before some kind of major democratic moment of democratic reversal, we're likely to see a lot of media criticism, right? and yeah. then it's it's like to come off. And I think some of what we see, indeed, some of what we see in Egypt is probably yeah, a bit of that, that, that was as well. Yes. Yeah. There's probably yeah. a bit of that that before the coup, we are seeing criticism directed not only mm -hmm. uh, uh, elected President Morsi, but um, but also at you know the kind of emerging threats from um, the military uh, establishment. Um, I think you're right. Um, so it does it doesn't necessarily capture capture everything in in that regard. And there's probably a bit of a lag as well uh, afterwards. Um, but it's interesting to see just how quickly the media seem to respond um, in yeah. various respects. Yeah, it's a good point. Well, Alan, what you're suggesting basically, just going beyond Egypt, yeah. is that <clears throat> whenever there's democratic backsliding, before the key events that make that happen, you should have an uptick yes. of this. So, so you have the spike and then, oops. Which, yeah, which is kind of an artifact, right? Mm. Because it's not really a, a more democratic, because no. the, the, the backsliding is, it, it's taking exactly. a lot. But mm. yeah, but in the discourse, it's going to be... Yeah, it's for what? Yes. I mean, I think eventually, by the time you know, <laughs> yeah. by the time democracy is gone, you may no longer have these spikes. Exactly. But, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I yeah. think that. Yeah. I think that's a very good point. Um, so the real problem is if some backsliding happens that there isn't a spike, because that means you're you're already gone. You know, right. you don't even have media yes. to yeah. talk about. What's yeah, yeah. You you reach the point of no return. Yeah. 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 Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I wonder if there's a way of getting into that. I think that's something we'll have to discuss. Um. But uh, any um, any more questions or? Well, I, I think this was very, very interesting and, and, and really thank you for your talk. And I, I actually, because we do have uh, <laughs> a few more minutes, um, because uh, of, uh, of how engaged you are with, uh, with academic Twitter and everything, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd like, I mean, I can stop the recording now. <laughs> and I was just, uh, I'd be happy to, to hear your thoughts. And it's, it's your, um, it's your uh, um, decision whether I can, I, I can stop. I mean, I don't mind. I'm sure they don't care what I say. Um, <laughs> like, uh, so I've been, I've tried to be in contact with the developer team at Twitter, um, with the academic team anyway. And um, I haven't got a response yet. Let me check my phone. Have I got a response? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't uh, think you. are not yeah. the only one. And well, exactly. Have... Yeah. Um, so I know I haven't got a response yet, um, and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it would seem to be massively self-defeating 
to do this. It doesn't make sense. I mean, as with everything uh, that bloke says, uh, it doesn't seem to make sense with some of the stated, like, you know, drive toward transparency and so on, and like, making public the code base and all that nonsense, and then, you know, closing the API. <laughs> like, okay, cool. Uh, if, yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, if it does close, it will save me some time maintaining a GitHub repo, but <laughs> like, like, that, is, that is small solace, um, I'm afraid, uh, for for what's going on. Uh, it seems like people don't even know the developer team whether they're closing the academic endpoint, so uh, I, I can't be of, of much use. I think uh, my own opinion on it is that it's, it's a real shame. I mean, Twitter were one of the uh, kind of standout cases of how you engage with academic communities uh, well and responsibly and so on. And now this has happened, it's, it's, uh, a, it will be a great loss. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, not only have they, you know, announced to close that, they have also, in at least one case, uh, stolen money. Uh, really? Yeah, this isn't public. Can you stop recording? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and everything for the recording. I know I just <laughs>